Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. This episode, I'm very grateful to be with a very old colleague and friend. Steve Eichel is a PhD psychologist, licensed, board certified. Uh, he does forensic psychology. He's a certified sex therapist as well. And Steve has been involved with the cultic studies field since 1975. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, he decided he would go to the Moonies, my former cult, in order to do a dissertation research exper experience um, up at the Barrytown facility, which I was at many, many times. Uh, I think you did that in... Um, April of 75. April of 75. So I wasn't even out of the Moonies yet till till uh, mm -hmm. till May of 76. Uh, so, but I don't remember meeting you at Barrytown. In any mm -hmm. case, uh, Steve was the president of the International Cultic Studies Association from 2012 to 2021. Uh, Steve has published, presented extensively on cult-related topics for 40 years. Steve, you're an expert in hypnosis. You, you, know, you are a fount of knowledge, and I'm so happy to share with my listeners your expertise. And um, before I ask you to, to um, introduce yourself and say what you want to say, I just want to comment that at the current moment, in the world, we're seeing such prevalence of cult stories, cult deaths in Kenya. Uh, Lori Vallow uh, was just convicted of uh, doomsday cult, you know, murdering her own children. Um, and uh, there's also a very organized effort uh, of, on behalf of cults trying to say, nope, you know, they're just new religious movements and and there's no such thing as brainwashing or mind control. Don't mm -hmm. believe any of the ex-members. So there's a whole psy psyops, you know, psychological warfare component to what's happening around the world. And Steve, people like yourself who've been doing this work, working with victims, helping them recover, testifying in courts, you have just such a wealth of knowledge that I want you to share with my audience. So with that, Thank here so it much. is. Please have an opening statement about what, what <laughs> what's going on. Well, I think uh, it's in, from my point of view, and, and you're right. I mean, we've both been in this field for many, many years. I met you and, at a CAN conference in 1981. I remember it very mm -hmm. well in Tampa. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been we've been doing this for a very long time, and uh, one of the things I seem to want to say is, uh, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So, uh, you know, the techniques that we see uh, are more sophisticated. The internet has certainly facilitated uh, in, undue influence in ways that nobody could have anticipated. That wasn't around when you and I were first uh, entering into the field, right. so to yep. speak. Um, so in some ways things are very different, but in other ways they are very, very much the same. Uh, really the, you know, the techniques, uh, that, have, that are used both to get people in groups like love bombing, for example, and of course, uh, the use of various hypnotic like techniques. And the one thing I will say that, uh, you know, one of the, certainly the major contributions you have made to the field, and really this is a major, major contribution I can't begin to tell you how important it is for me to point this out in court cases. And that is your statement uh, uh, that that uh, cults use induce phobias. Mm. That is incredibly important. If, if there's one thing I have to choose to show to demonstrate how powerful uh, cults are with people, it's by explaining to a jury, and they do get it, explaining to a jury that, you know, that this is your entire, not only your tired, entire existence uh both physical and spiritual emotional psychological that's on the line but for example with the moonies and in other cultic groups as well uh your ancestors uh <laughs> your progeny i mean the, you know we're, we're talking about 
um, uh, disastrous results that uh, that are almost indescribable to people outside of these groups. And that's it, it, the induction of that phobia. If I had to pick one thing that holds people spellbound in these groups, it is that it's fear. And of course, we see on a much broader scale, right? Mm-hmm. And you've, of course, again written, you know, written. I think probably the first book uh, to come out and say that you know that the that Trumpism is a cult. Uh, so and same same thing, fear, right? The induction of so fear. let me just comment for my listeners who may not know a little bit of my story. I come from a Jewish background, so I didn't believe in Satan or mm-hmm. demon possession. Mm-hmm. As the mm-hmm. Lori Vallow case, they she believed her children were possessed by demons. They couldn't cast them out, and so they had to kill their bodies because they said they were zombies. In any case, in my case, I was taken to see the Exorcist movie in 1974 when it came out. Then we were brought by van up to uh, Tarrytown and heard Sun Myung Moon himself say God made the Exorcist movie, and this movie is what would happen to anyone who left the church. And I can point to that moment when I stopped thinking at all. I was so afraid of being possessed uh, by the demons that I did thought stopping and everything else. And what I like to say is, you know, if you think about, um, if you have an elevator phobia, you can't imagine riding safely and comfortably. You can only imagine plummeting to your death or being trapped for eternity. The minute you can visualize riding safely and comfortably, you're on your way out. And there's a direct parallel to anyone in a mind control state. But you have to explain there's legitimate fear where there's actual danger, and then there's artificial fear, which is the yeah. phobia programming. So thank, exactly. so thank you for letting me just uh, flesh that out a little bit more for our listeners. So, so going back to, you know, you've, you've been asked to forensically evaluate some high-profile cases. We know Patty Hearst was uh, abducted. In fact, the same month I was recruited into the Moonies, February of 74, she robbed the banks. She went on trial. And F. Lee Bailey, her attorney, kind of caved on, on pushing the brainwashing defense and yeah. um, and and so Tanya, who robbed banks, even though she was a multimillionaires, you know, uh, was found guilty. Later pardoned by 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 the president. Um, but we have had numerous unsuccessful, high-profile cases where the public still doesn't understand how intelligent, educated people can be subjected to this yeah. process. Yeah, we live in a in a very um, strange time when you know there's on the one hand a belief that you know exposure to uh, you know to RuPaul or you know, exposure to uh, 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 drag queens is going to you know destroy a child's sexuality for the rest of his life. So there's influence there, yeah. you see, but not not influence in a high demand group. It's uh, it is really. It's it's difficult to justify in my mind, right. and and that's the kind of thing that I, I often have to point out if I'm in front of a, if I'm in front of a judge or a jury. I have to point out that you know on the one hand, the, the law is filled with examples of undue influence. The law, you know, we have lots and lots of experience um, in the general culture with with uh, the belief that people can be influenced even outside of their awareness. Mm-hmm. And yet, on the other hand, we, you know, we uh, almost give free reign to cultic groups. And to some degree, that that's a function of, uh, of our constitution, which is, you know, different than a lot of other countries, a lot of other democracies. Uh, for, it's a, conf- you know, it's a conflation, in my opinion, of, of the First mm-hmm. Amendment. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, it's just, uh, I, I think people, uh, I think the bottom line is people don't want to believe that they can be influenced. That's really the bottom line. Yeah, Alan uh, Shefflin, law professor emeritus, who is on the the uh, the International Cultic Studies Association board for and was a former president, talks about the myth of the unmalleable mind. We all right. want to believe. 
Only weak people could be brainwashed. Only stupid, stupid people, people. Only people from bad families. Only people who don't have proper religious education. And we have thousands of counter examples to show that it's wrong. Um, yes, absolutely. And one of the things I, again, in a courtroom situation, as well as uh, if I'm giving a talk, uh, one of the things I like to point out is, and, and sometimes I'll come, you know, equipped with all this, with a list of studies. But I like to point out the fact when people ask me, or I used to ask people, who here thinks that they can't be brainwashed? And, you know, in the past, especially, I would get a lot of hands. Not so many, not so much this time. That's progress, in my yep. opinion. But uh, in the past, everyone used to raise their hands. And I'd say, okay, look at everyone, look at each other. Everyone who's raising their hands, look at each other and, and tell me, which one of you are the psychopaths and which one of you are the, the psychotics? Because those are the two people who can't, two classes of people who cannot be brainwashed. Uh, if we were good at influencing brainwashing psychopaths or sociopaths and psychotic people, then mental hospitals would work and prisons would work, but they don't. I, I love mean, that example. I have not heard that one before. Look yeah. around. <laughs> which yeah. one Which one is a psychopath? I love that example. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So it's really, it's very important to point out uh, to people that, uh, and, and here's where, you know, that black and white thinking that, that permeates a lot of folks, and it's not just in cults, um, that black and white thinking where either you're brainwashable or you're not. And I like to point out that, you know, we all or at least most of us, if we're not psychotic and not sociopaths, uh, we, we are all capable of being brainwashed at various points in our lives. And so a uh, very famous psychologist named Albert Bandura, back in 1982, wrote an article called The Psychology of Chance Encounters. And uh, it had a tremendous impact on me. Because basically what he says is uh, the, the main cause, if you will, of people becoming involved in cults is bad luck. And I'm not talking about people born into groups. That's a whole right. separate category. But the people who, like you, people who are indoctrinated into a cultic group or or the experience I went through in Barrytown in just one week uh, at a CARP seminar. It's Gary Sharp was my That's our so leader, funny. By the way. He's now a lawyer. <laughs> Gary and I knew <laughs> each other. I would do the introductory <laughs> lecture in New York send them up to, to Gary for the three day. That's so funny. Exactly. Well, Gary, you know, when I met Gary uh, out of the group, I hadn't recognized him at first because he'd grown a beard. And when I knew him, he was he did not have a beard. Um, and we, we had a good laugh about that, especially, um, it's a whole nother story, but there was somebody that I was at Barrytown with, a, a guy that I met there, Charlie, who actually did have a full-blown psychotic episode. Mm. I mean, I, di I didn't know it. At the time, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't recognize it. I was only in college, but uh, he did have a full-blown psychotic episode, was hospitalized afterwards, um, and he went around defacing a lot of moon posters at, in Barrytown, calling him the Antichrist. And, and uh, Gary said, oh, yeah, I remember that. Mm. <laughs> I remember those posters. And anyway, yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's amazing how many brilliant people. Gary was a very yeah. effective lecturer. Oh tremendously yeah effective. and he Absolutely. married another former moon who who wrote a book with her mom if i remember correctly barbara underwood uh was it right. hostage right. to heaven or something like yeah, that she, she's she's well known in the yeah field, there definitely. are so many former moonies out there i wish they would surface and share their story yeah. but most people yeah. are embarrassed still and I understand that because, again, like you mentioned in the early uh, early part of this interview, uh, the vast majority of people look at cult members and go like, oh, I could never be that. I'm not that stupid. I'm not that gullible. I'm not that weak. Right. Um, so getting back to my original point, uh, which is that we are all, or again, most of us, if you're not psychotic, if you're not a sociopath, at various points in our lives, we are vulnerable. And as, and as Bandura put it, um, with saying that uh, this is an issue related to bad luck. If I'm in a, if I'm in a period of transition, if right. I'm, uh, if my, you know, girlfriend dumped me, if my Guilty. wife is divorced, girlfriend me, dumped me. Yeah, exactly. If I'm changing schools, if I'm without a job, whatever, whatever it may be, just normal stresses, normal transitions right. that, that folks go through. If I then have the bad luck, of encountering a cult recruiter, that's when I'm going to get recruited into a cult. 
If, on the other hand, my life is going really well, I'm pretty satisfied, everything's going great, and then I run into a cult recruiter, maybe not so much. I might not be recruited into the cultic group. So it's really a function of bad luck, number one. But number two, it's really very, very important for everyone to realize, again, everyone who's not a psychotic, not a sociopath, everyone to realize that at various points in times, we are all vulnerable. Right. So I also want to add that I do believe, and I think you share this, that a little bit of preventive education uh, where people are hearing people's stories and Mm -hmm. saying what they wish they had asked or wish they had done, like, you know. Or wish they had known. Like my mom, mom, when I first got back from my three-day workshop, even though they were pressuring me for the seven-day workshop, said, let's go talk to the rabbi. Let's go talk to the rabbi. So I said, sure. And what the rabbi should have said is, uh, Steve, I've never heard of this group, but but please know if it's legitimate, it will stand up to scrutiny. Don't go back. Don't talk to them for a few weeks and let's research it together. My life would have been very (laughs) different, but he thought I wanted to, you know, convert to Christianity. So he offered to study the Torah with me, which was not my question at all. Right you hit on a really, really important point. And uh, of course, a lot of us have said this over the years, the single most important thing someone can do if they are in the in a situation where, they feel like, where you feel like you're being recruited, you feel like you're being uh, pressured, most important thing you can do is demand time. Yes. That's that, you know, demand time. No, no, you got to sign this now. If you don't sign this workshop now, you know, you're going to miss out on A, B, C, or D, or it's going to be twice as expensive or whatever. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is just what you said. I hear what, you know, I I got the information you gave me. Okay. I'm going to go check it out on my own. I hate to use this term because it's been perverted by, uh, by QAnon, (laughs) by the worst players on the internet. But yeah, in, in this, in this case, yeah, you have to do your own research. (laughs) <laughs> but research people who know about the group, not the recruiters right. or not right. just, you know, phony websites. I do want to comment just that, you know, when I wrote Combating Cult Mind Control in 1988, uh, there was no internet. And once right. the internet started rolling, I had to rewrite it completely almost because mm-hmm. people can now stare into a screen for 10 hours a day. They don't need to go to an isolated physical location to be love bombed. They can be swarmed online in discussion exactly. groups. And there's all kinds of AI, you know, using our personal data. We used to have to it's ask even gonna people- get worse about their background and, you know, their family structure and find areas to hone in on. They don't need to do that anymore. If you're a high profile target, they want you or they want your money. Absolutely true. I I saw, uh, I don't remember what it was. It was a TV program, but at any rate, uh, I saw a a, a fascinating um, demonstration of what you're talking about where, you know, a guy pretended to be a mind reader and meanwhile, his partner was in the back on the internet Googling everybody who was I think I saw up. the same video. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm getting yeah. a vision. Your dog's name is Lucky. <gasps> How did exactly. you know that? And they, they're getting the messaging in their little, uh, right. you know, magic ear, magician's magic right. ear. So can exactly. we switch gears, please? Because you mm-hmm. are one of the few true experts forensically on undue influence. And I remember that you were consulted on the Malvo assassination case, mm-hmm. yes. and which I, I looked into and I really felt like the kid was a minor. I mean, talk to us about what you thought about that case and what sure. whether you think the uh, judge and jury <clears throat> found correctly or incorrectly that was a heartbreaker i have to mm. say and and you know we're talking about first of all you know uh, uh, an individual who just looking on looking at lee boyd malvo on paper i mean he's a mass murderer uh, Tell our know, listeners the story right it was the dc sniper case this is the dc yep. sniper who uh, was um, targeted 
very, very specifically targeted by a man named John Muhammad, yep. who is who had uh, tried with two other boys before Lee. He was looking for somebody. He was looking for a minor to engage in this plot that he mm-hmm. had. And of course, we don't know for sure what his pl- what his thinking was because John Muhammad wouldn't talk, and he ha- was subsequently executed. He got the death penalty, so we'll never know what was going on uh-huh. in his mind. But most of us, most of us involved in the case, believe that what he ultimately wanted to do was was murder his mm. wife, his ex wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it was really related to custody. Mm. Uh, she had full custody of his children. You can imagine why. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, obviously, on at a cus- at custody hearings or an evaluation, he must have John Muhammad must have looked pretty bad. Um, so she got full custody, and. <clears throat> Most of us believe that these killings, that what he was trying to do was establish a pattern of random killings near his ex-wife so that then when she got killed, it would be considered just, you know, part of the the random Mm. killing um, and he wouldn't be implicated. Got it. Uh, And then, of course, the the children would be his because their mom would be dead. Uh, What he told Lee Boyd Malvo, of course, was that uh, he he laid out this entire plot of uh, a plan, rather, of establishing essentially a, uh, a a black nation uh part that would be partly in canada partly in the u.s um he w- that that the killing sprees uh were <clears throat> were an attempt to blackmail the, the government to uh provide the land and provide them funding mm. for this nation of uh, of of african americans because uh, according to john muhammad what right. was, uh, brainwashing lee to believe uh, you know, the United States was uh, was run by uh, white supremacists, um, and that the only way blacks could could have real freedom would be to have their own uh, nation. So it's sort of a takeoff of the nation of Islam mm-hmm. to a degree, bit of a takeoff on the the old Garvey movement from the nineteen twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially, it was a black separatist movement. Uh, or the, again. I think this was invented. Right. Uh, I don't think I don't think uh, John Muhammad had any plan of this, but this is what he was. This is how he indoctrinated Lee Boyd Malvo. Then he also um, and he targeted Lee because Lee was without was basically without right. a father. Um, was kind of almost a street yep. urchin. Uh, he, didn't sense. he meet him at fourteen or something or earlier? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No, he met him. He befriended him. I mean, it was it was really. Uh, a case of grooming. Yes. I mean, he groomed the boy and his mother. Mm. And that's important to realize. He befriended Lee's mother mm-hmm. so that mom trusted yeah. him. And mm. like many people, mom ultimately wanted to get to the United States and, uh, you know, as an immigrant, mm-hmm. uh, legally or not. And, uh, and, and John said, well, I'm going to get your son to the United States first. Mm. And, and you, I mean, it's sort of understandable right. that, you can see, okay, here's a father figure. He looked on the surface to be a, a good guy. I'm going to let my son go with him to, to the United States so that he can right. then immigrate and uh, and live in the U.S. So mom let <clears throat> let Lee go with John Muhammad uh, to Washington State. And once he was there, he taught him how to shoot a rifle. and He became a sharpshooter. Mm. Uh, he was filled with constant video games that were uh, oriented, you know, basically shooting uh, games to, again, uh, hone his skills. Yep. And he was isolated. Lee was completely isolated and fed this narrative by John Muhammad, right. uh, you know, about how <clears throat> they were going to establish this. Uh, they were going to be pioneers. They were going to be revolutionary leaders. Uh and pioneers that were going to, you know, establish this this country for Black Americans. Right. So I believe at the point of the arrests, uh, Lee was seventeen. Am I remember correctly? Still yes. a minor, you know, mm-hmm. sense. And it was your job to present a point of view right. that he shouldn't be uh, have capital punishment. Oh no, well, we were we were arguing in favor of him being declared uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. Oh, talk to uh, us about the legal <clears throat> strategy, please. Yeah, the the legal strategy, and uh, you know, again, I can't I can't speak entirely to the legal strategy, not being an attorney, right. but I, we certainly worked closely with the attorneys. There were uh, there was a psychiatrist and uh, another psychologist, of course, mm-hmm. uh, and and myself. Um, we had we also had a fascinating uh, an expert on child soldiers because that's basically what 
uh, what Muhammad was mm-hmm. doing. John Muhammad was converting Lee into a child soldier. And of course, you uh, I don't know about your audience, and I'm guessing you know exactly what I'm referring to. This is a process that's done primarily in, in Africa, uh, where uh, children are literally <clears throat> kidnapped and and f- converted uh, into child into soldiers. Yeah, and often uh, they're literally told to murder their brother, sister, or parents, absolutely. or be killed right on the spot. And Absolutely. sometimes they'll, you know, prod by pulling the trigger of the of the boy holding the the the, the rifle. But once once the the first murder happens, it sets the person on a traumatic path. It is, in fact, what psychologists refer to as trauma bonding. Yeah. It is it is a it is a method of forcing a bond between the brainwasher and the victim. Very again, very very definitely along the lines of what you first referred to with uh, you know with the Symbionese Liberation Army and Patty right. Hearst. That's exactly what they were doing mm-hmm. with her. They were they they converted they made Patty Hearst into a child soldier in essence, even though she wasn't technically a child at that time. Right. Uh, um, so, so so please so yeah. Steve, um, you know I did my doctoral dissertation trying mm-hmm. to connect the dots with trafficking law. You know, to name the different models, Lift and Singer, Shine's models, and my model mm-hmm. of the Bite model, and mm-hmm. Shefflin's uh, social influence model. But I really, you know, would love you to opine on, like, what else is it going to take for judges and juries to make it a crime? to brainwash or mind control or doing a systematic social influence process to quote Margaret Singer on a person to do criminal activity? I wish I could answer that question. I don't, I wish I knew what it would take. I mean, the, the, what gives me a little bit of hope is the fact that there, you know, just as there are countries and I'm talking about democratic countries here, because certainly one way to crush a cult is to become even more cultic, right? Like what China does with uh, with uh, yes. Qigong. I mean, you know, uh, that is not what we right. want. Uh, we do not want, you know, uh, uh, a, an even bigger cult to get rid of the smaller. Like cult, Falun so Gong, you mean? Uh, and uh, excuse me, uh, right? Falun I, Gong, I, yes. I figured I knew what you meant, but Putin yeah, also yeah, has, you know, doesn't want anyone but Absolutely. the Russian Orthodox Church to be, exist, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know they go after the the you know the Jehovah's Witnesses, and yeah, the, you know we have we have our own issues obviously with Jehovah's Witnesses. But to to do what Putin is doing, no, that's not. You don't cure the cancer by killing the patient, right? And I don't believe in uh, banning government banning, but I do. No. I don't believe that we should be supporting with tax exemption groups that violate people's human rights by deceptively yeah, recruiting well, them. <clears throat> Again, this country has, because of our constitution, which uh, you know, ninety nine percent of the time we, at least speaking for myself, I support. Yeah. Um, but you know, thanks to the way the First Amendment has been interpreted, mm. uh, you know, the First Amendment unfortunately doesn't say we guarantee the freedom of thought mm-hmm. of a per, you know of, a, of the individual. Right. We just say we guarantee the freedom of speech. Right. Um, so. <clears throat> Uh, there are laws that have been instituted in the, the most uh, most importantly right now for us is in, in Britain. Right. Uh, Britain has a a, 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 a law of, uh, against uh, coercive control. Yes. And that's what we need here. Granted, it's hard to prove at times and, and it, you know, it is murky. It's messy. But that's life. Right. Life is often murky and messy. Right. That doesn't mean that we ignore it, right? Okay, and we pretend it doesn't exist. So uh, I I think that what we need to you know what we what we need is um, uh, you know a concerted effort politically, and I don't see this happening, and I don't think it's going to happen in the near future because of what's in the United the States. You mean climate. in the United States? Yeah. Unless uh, the, the Democrats States. get a supermajority and we expand the Supreme Court and. Uh, do don't months. forget it's a Demo- it's under a democratic administration that Scientology got its tax exemption Clint- finally. Clinton um, was a bad actor, big friend of John Travolta and they right. if I remember correctly, 
Clinton was even pressuring Germany, how could you not give right. Scientology tax exemption? And exactly. German government is, we know cults. <laughs> we had Hitler. <laughs> what are you talking about? This is not a religious group. <laughs> we, yeah, we know it when we see it. <laughs> Sir, but, you know, it is, uh, yeah. it is uh, let's just agree, authoritarian groups don't want to be regulated. They want a free pass. Mm -hmm. And if they have a religious, you know, veneer, they're going to call, you know, religious freedom uh, in, yeah, this in this country. Right. right. But, um, you know, I, I really think informed consent is a rather important legal construct. And I know, because I asked the women flirting with me when they were recruiting me, are you part of a religious group? And if they said yes... I would have said goodbye, but they lied, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. lied, and they lied, and they lied. And sure, my research on the Moonies was through the Collegiate Association of Research of Principles. Yes, that I was mean, my. Where's religion in there? That was my front group at Queens College. Mm -hmm. After I was told to drop out, I was told to go back and start a student club so I could recruit students mm -hmm. to drop out and be good Moonies. Exactly. So there's there's that piece as well. So, Steve, um, all I can say is that I am hoping with deep data analyses that we may be able to figure out scientifically a way to demonstrate uh, on a yeah. continuum uh, on ethical influences. <laughs> and, and I really like Shefflin's model. Look at the influency and their unique you know, characteristics, vulnerabilities, the influencer or the predator or the predatory organization mm -hmm. and and how they influence and the, you know, consequences of this relationship. There's a framework there for experts to explain to juries. And it's important to understand, and this is why, you know, on the one hand, there are people I've heard people criticize or or challenge, if you will, the bite model, your model, for example, is as being quote unquote too vague. But they have to be. They they you can't I think what you're saying is really important. So for person A, you know, being more hypnotic may be what works for that person. For person B, focusing on the fear is what may work for that person. For person C, it may be more love bombing. I mean there are some people who sure. are again who are either who are extremely difficult to hypnotize, so you don't use hypnotic techniques right. with them. Uh, you emphasize something else. And that's, so, uh, you know, again, what we're talking about here, and, and this goes back to what Margaret Singer used to say about there being a systematic, you know, there's a system that's involved right. here. It's planned, it's systematic, it's discussed, it's not spontaneous. Right. Um, Michael Langoni, the the former executive director of the of, uh, of the International Cultic Studies Association, used to talk about the ethics of communication, and I think that's really important. You know, when two people meet, there's an underlying assumption and expectation that we are both going to be influencers and be influenced. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, and what what happens, of course, in cultic recruitment is that the cult recruiter is is lying, is falsely presenting right. themselves as someone who can be influenced right. as well as influencing. Right. That's not true, of course. They have they, they, You are not influencing them at all. Right. They are targeting you. So it's a, it, is, it is, as you mentioned, informed consent. Right. There is no informed consent. Yeah, in it's situation. often two on one or three on one. I do want to come back. You mentioned, and it's the first time I've ever heard anyone call the bite model vague because it's so specific it has a ton of different mm -hmm. variables and in fact that's labor I mean. trafficking and and yeah. sex trafficking experts love my model because it yeah. explains the coercion part of trafficking fraud yeah. force or coercion but on the influence continuum as you correctly say you need that evaluation on the specific person what of those elements were right. effective on that person so by uh, vague was the wrong ah. term. I, what I meant was over, all inclusive. Uh -huh. Okay. So, and which, you know, some people think, well, if it's all inclusive, then it can't be right. 
Um, my argument is that your framework, my your framework is is a way of bringing together lots of other frameworks. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and that to me is extremely useful. Yeah, um, I, st I started with Leon Festinger's cognitive dissonance model: thoughts, right. feelings, and right. behaviors, and. So right. those are three of the four, and then I added information control. And in this digital age, I'd say the I should be bigger than the B and the T and the E because it it you yeah, you yeah. co-opt somebody's beliefs, you're they're going to change their behavior and and everything else. We still we still you know it's amazing to me, and I'm guessing amazing to you that you can have a man be found liable for sexual assault. And his support among his base grows <laughs> instead of decreases. That you know, because again, he's able to he's able to couch that in this bubble of tremendous misinformation, saying, "See, this is again, this is proof." And by the cults, do this too. Of exactly, course, as you know, we're you know, persecuted. You know, oh, therefore, we must well, be doing God's will. Right, right, right. I committed a crime. <laughs> okay. And you catch me in the crime, and you convict me of the crime. Oh, you're persecuting right. me, not because of the crime, but because of my religion. That's what right. they claim. And of course, Trump also says the same thing. Right. Um, but it's it's I am what I'm saying here is that as you noted, the I in the bite model is perhaps even more important now than ever before. And I think that uh, the events of 2016 through. 2020, of course, and 2021 with the insurrection, yeah. and even to this day, that seems to be very clear. Yeah. The, the the you know, and and granted, uh, uh, Joe Biden got tremendous criticism, and and I think to some degree justifiably so for trying to you know uh, develop an office of misinformation. The government needs to be out of that. We can't have the government involved in that. There's got that's got to be through private entities, in my opinion, because otherwise. Too many people accuse the government because there is a, a potential. Oh, for a thousand percent! But that's yeah, why they yeah. need you know scholars who right. are experts. And of course, in, right. in the cult of Trump, I talk about fourth generation psychological warfare, attacking experts, attacking right. science, attacking institutions, just to create more chaos, confusion, and to make people more vulnerable to the certainty voice of the demagogue. That's exactly you. You hit the nail right on the head. As we both know, right? One of the most powerful hypnotic techniques that you can use with people who say, "I can't be hypnotized," is a confusion technique. Yep. Right. You you set me up because I wanted to ask you to talk about hypnosis because most mm -hmm. people don't understand it. They maybe were exposed right. to a stage hypnotist, saw people barking right. like a dog, thought it was fakery. Tell right. me what you what your what your conclusion is after decades of studying hypnosis, being trained in hypnosis. Sure. Hypnosis is a a method for directing people into a natural altered state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. it is. Um, we all go through altered states of consciousness all yep. the time. Uh, you know, uh, you're you're watching a movie. You're fascinated by that movie. It's really interesting. The movie ends. All of a sudden, you realize, oh my god! For the last half hour, I've had to pee tremendously. I'm in great pain. If I don't get to the <laughs> if I don't get to the bathroom right away, I'm in trouble. Well, that pain didn't develop the second the movie ended. That pain was always there. But you were because you were so in in essence, your your consciousness was so. Uh, invested in the movie, you were in essence experiencing hypnotic anesthesia. Yeah, you were absorbed. Uh, you were absorbed, exactly. Absorption being one of the major characteristics of of both hypnosis and cultic indoctrination. Yep. And um, when when I so, did the the two chapters with Alan Shefflin on the dark side of hypnosis, mm -hmm. that was one of the big challenges: is which definition of hypnosis do we use? Yeah, we pretty yeah. much used what you just described, but we added uh, the heightened suggestibility component. Yeah. yeah. So again, you've got a you know, and, and I and I understand that scientists researchers. Or have difficulty parsing this out, and and I think it's it's not possible to completely parse it out because we know high suggestibility 
uh, is associated with high hypnotizability, but high hypnotizability is also increases suggestibility. Right. So, uh, so one of the things that that and this is and what's really important, especially in Eastern related cults that that tend to over rely on meditation and yeah. things like that, is that the suggestibility is still there even after the hypnosis or the meditation yep. ends. Okay, that's what's really crucial for folks to understand. So if I'm, you know, if I'm do, doing clinical hypnosis, which is the only kind of hypnosis I do, I don't just do you're a licensed mental like health professional, right? So if I do clinical hypnosis and I, in, in, and I um, invite my client to engage in trance work, and then I bring them out of hypnosis, I will often tell them what you want to do now, especially if it's we don't have enough time to debrief totally, but most of the time. Um, I always leave at least 15 or 30 minutes in the session to debrief right. because you can't send somebody out. If I send someone out after hypnotizing them, they get in their car, they turn on the radio, they hear a commercial. They're more likely to buy whatever that commercial mm -hmm. is selling, even though they're no longer in my office under hypnosis. Right. Yeah, no, you need to reorient. So, I don't do clinical hypnosis because yeah. I want people to trust me. So in my practice, I explain hypnosis. I'll show yeah. tapes by Darren Brown and by other hip stage hypnotists, and et cetera, who do the impermissible types of hypnotic stuff mm -hmm. that clinical people would never dare to even think about. But um, yeah. it is a powerful, positive tool for so many things, pain control, mm -hmm. sleep, uh, there's so many good things, uh, and, and uh, in my opinion, and I'm going to ask you, but I think we're overprescribing pain medications when people can learn how to dial down yeah. their own, you know, the way their brain interprets pain. Very much a whole separate topic, but I certainly, I certainly agree with you. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's important to you know it's important to know. For example, when I work with people who've been in in cultic groups, I sometimes they'll ask for hypnosis, and I say, "Whoa, okay, wait yeah. a minute, no, I it's rare. I would have to sit and think if I've ever used hypnosis with somebody who's come out of a cult. I don't think I have, but maybe there's one or two occasions. I don't know. But yeah, it, here's I want to talk about something more more poignant Please. maybe and that is you know you don't have to call it hypnosis for it to be hypnotic it's, thank you for saying that okay that's really important now legally and this is where things get weird because legally it's hypnosis when i use the word hypnosis so in other words if i use guided imagery right. legally that's not hypnosis scientifically it right. is okay <laughs> and so and, and that's guided always meditations, conflict. visualizations yeah. Yeah. are these are the research is very yeah. clear. When you're engaging in in those kinds of activities, you're you're firing the same kinds of par the same parts of the brain yeah. are be are firing that we find in hypnosis. Mm -hmm. So you know if somebody if you go to a uh, uh, you know a, a an evening lecture that involves a meditation, and then after that. We're going to, you know, invite you to sign up for our classes, but there's no hypnosis involved. There's no undue influence involved. No, that's not true. There most certainly is. Obviously, there are many, many situations in everyday life where this is done. I mean, uh, it, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, a good, we all know uh, a good salesperson is going to use influence but we expect that if i go to a car if i go to buy a new car i expect that the car salesperson is going to try to influence me that's what they're there for right um, i can't help but mention tony robbins and nlp mm, neuro linguistic yeah. programming uh yeah. and and how many trainings he's done for car salesmen as well as corporate executives and he'll, he'll and uh Rich, yeah Rich, uh, and Richard Bandler and his gun. Yes, Richard um, Bandler is, was one of the co-founders of NLP, who was involved mm -hmm. with a murder. I, I'm not sure. I don't think he was found guilty, but it was very no, suspicious. No, he was not. But the point is, is when when Robbins, uh, you know, has people visualize themselves 
you know, getting bigger and stronger and more confident, just visualize it and they go into an altered state and you see their posture changing, you're seeing a, a mm -hmm. hypnotic suggestion, um, in my opinion. Oh, no, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm debating whether or not to bring this up or not. But uh, there was, and probably still is, there, there are people out there who believe, who, who believe that through hypnosis, you can enlarge a woman's breasts. There was, <laughs> I was, I actually watched a, hip, a lay hypnotist many, many years ago engage in quote unquote breast enhancement hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are many things that you can do. For example, I can, I can give myself another quarter of an inch of height by, you know, really straightening my back up. And so, of course, you know, what they would do is they'd measure a woman's breasts put her under hypnosis, give her suggestions for breast enhancement, measure it again. And sure enough, there was a slight mm -hmm. increase, you know, in, in size. So that was proof, unquote, quote, unquote, that it was, uh, that it works. But of course, we know that's not true. Right. We know that from, from controlled studies that that's right. not true. Uh, but on the other hand, there are definitely physical, there, there are physical, um, um, attributes or physical functions that, that, we know can be uh, influenced and even controlled by hypnosis. Yeah, I'm remembering uh, a case where they hypnotized someone, said, uh, we're going to rub poison ivy on your hand. Mm -hmm. It wasn't poison ivy, but they broke out. And then, right. <laughs> then they exactly. did on the other hand, you know, this is, we're going to do spearmint, and it was poison ivy, and it didn't break out. And that's really yeah. interesting about the mind-body relationship keeping in mind that that because that work because that was true for that person may not be true for the next yes. person that's where the things become so very individualized yep. and uh yeah so we, we you know we need to keep in mind that uh that most cultic conversion does not work in the long mm -hmm. term um but as i like to remind people you know if 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 a uh, if merck comes out with a medication that only kills 10% of the people who right. take it, that medication's not going to be allowed on right. the market. <laughs> so when, when I get, when I'm told that, oh, well, you know, uh, these 50 people all were exposed to a Scientology communications course, but only 10 of them or only 15 of them, you know, actually then signed up for further Scientology lessons, um, you know, that proves that there is no such thing as brainwashing. I say that that's ridiculous. That doesn't prove that proves what that proves to me is that you had 15 people, let's say out of the 50, 15 people who are, you know, who are primed or who are at the stage where they're vulnerable right. to undue influence. And we don't know about the other people. Maybe they'll come back next week, next month. Who knows? Yep. I, you, you just hit on a very important point. I want to just mention as a broader principle, and it, it's, it, it, it falls under the category of the straw man argument that cult right. apologists mm -hmm. use because they say brainwashing means 100% uh, of the people are brainwashed forever. You know, right. and if anyone ever leaves, it proves it's not brainwashing. And all of us experts are like, no, no, this is what you were saying. It doesn't work on everybody in a particular case. Yeah. And the fact that someone's in for 10 years working for free uh, doesn't mean that it's not, they weren't brainwashed for the 10 years until they were like, I can't do this anymore. I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, the standards that are being used, and this does get to the forensic end of it. I mean, please, uh, you know, the, the the standards that that are that defense attorneys primarily are are trying to use make no sense. They they are not the they are not the standards that's applied anywhere else. Nobody says, well, you know, that cancer treatment only works fifty percent of the time, so therefore forget it. Right, it doesn't exist. It's not real. Nobody says right. that. But most people say, well, I hope I'm that 50% that it works right. on. Um, so uh, it's a standard that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And, and finally, and most importantly, when we come down to the individual, when I'm dealing with this particular person in this particular case, in this particular court, who cares whether or not the other nine people were quote unquote brainwashed? All I need to know is that this person yep. was. 
And, you know, nobody, again, nobody, as, as you've said, as many people in our field have said, nobody joins a cult. Right. Nobody goes out and says, you know what? I want to find something that's bogus, that, that is harmful, and that I can devote my entire life and all my resources yeah, and to. Be <laughs> and be trafficked. And be trafficked. Labor trafficked yeah. or sex yeah. trafficked. I'm very glad that you've uh, that you've focused so much in your own work on trafficking because I really think you know again that is especially um, uh, uh, with litigation, especially I, especially uh, when we're dealing with cultic groups, the t- trafficking laws that are already on the books are uh, we are beginning to apply yes. those, and uh, and that's really that's really important because that is exactly what's going yeah, on. Yeah, Keith Raniere, as far as I'm concerned, R. Kelly. Uh, most a lot of the evangelical cults use children yes. uh you know i i i uh, one of the cases i was involved with uh unfortunately it was thrown out for a technicality but it involved a lot of the same people that uh deborah that debbie shriver wrote about in oh, her book so these are all on the alamo uh, cult. Survi- mm-hmm. right, right, they're all survivors of the tony alamo cult. Right. um and and you know all those beautiful denim sequin jackets that stars were wearing for years well th- that was done by traffic yes. labor period yeah, exactly kids kids often cross across you know taken across state lines yes. even all right little children uh who are not you know they're not being properly educated they're not being properly cared for and they're certainly not being paid right. <laughs> anything right. So and here they are, you know, doing hours and hours and weeks and weeks of, of free yeah. labor. We could talk forever, but before we wrap up in a few more minutes, I really would love to hear you weigh in on the gender wars, the sexuality wars. I see it myself mm-hmm. as part of just a deliberate effort to polarize people, to hate the other Absolutely. and where the extremes are commanding too much airtime and the moderate you know public is like missing out on the human rights and the basics please tell us your thoughts well i have two two kinds of thoughts one politically i think it's strictly a distraction Mm -hmm. i think it is a way of you know as, as i put it how many how many drag queens are shooting people up i mean here you know here we've got folks who are focused in florida and other states who are focused laser focus on the two or three you know instances where drag where kids were exposed to drag queens or whatever um or transsexuals transgendered um uh and uh and in the meantime right now gun violence is the number one uh killer of our children and we're not doing anything about it (laughs) so to me that's mind-boggling but yes uh you know I think so. So what I'm saying, of course, is that to some degree, I think this is a moral panic, yes. um, and it's a distraction. It's keeping us away from the real. It's keeping some people away from the real issues. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I'm as a sex therapist, I've, I'm exposed to a, a great deal of work, research, as well as people um, on the transgendered uh, continuum, on the gender s- uh, spectrum, so yes. to speak. Um, I think that uh, I think that for young people, it's a very confusing time, and they're experimenting the way people, the way young people have always experimented. And so, in the past, they experimented with different roles and different. You know, I'm going to be a bully one day. I'm going to be a nice guy the next day. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. So now they're they're to some degree experimenting. Well, I'm going to be queer. <laughs> I'm going to be you know I'm going to be uh, 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 transgendered or you know I'm whatever. Um, most of that just plays out. Most of that, if you pretty much just say, okay, you know, just be supportive. Don't push it one yep. way or the other. Eventually, it's kind of like uh, binge drinking in the sense that uh, most uh, a tremendous number of, of college seniors would qualify as alcoholics. Mm. And then the minute they graduate and start working, they're no longer alcoholics. Right. But I want to... Why? I- because they get... Why? Because if they get drunk... They get drunk in school, they skip a class. If you get drunk at work, you get fired. So, so amazingly, binge drinkers stop binging when they when they go into the real world. I think that happens a lot with gender with our teenagers. When they move, they move into adulthood, they figure it out pretty much. 
Then you've got the extremes on both sides. Right, but I, I, I can't help but mention, because it's the statistics are coming out on mental health and young people who are online yeah. for 10, 14 yeah. hours oh, yeah. a day. And yeah. how can it's being bad. online that many hours not affect your brain? I totally agree with you. Um, and uh, and again, we, you know, we're back to the influence issue right. uh, because certainly this is a really big issue with suicide and eating yes. disorders. I mean, you want to talk about social influence, harmful social influence. I mean, and we all know most of people who follow this know, for example, in Japan, you know, uh, you know there have been a number of instances in which there have been literally epidemics of, of suicides mm -hmm. uh, that, that have been uh, that contagion uh, effect seem to be social social contagion yeah. exactly in uh in in this country anyone who works with uh with uh teenagers who have anorexia or bulimia uh the major issue is the uh, the influence that they can uh obtain over the internet how to fake out how to you know how to fake your doctor uh how to drink enough water so that you weigh more things like right. that but um, i want to ask you just uh and you know just want to know your thoughts on it, but the idea that um, if you are having body dysmorphia, gender mm -hmm. you know dysmorphia, um, puberty blocking medications or hormones, what are your thoughts about young people being affirmed and immediately you know given testosterone or or estrogen or what? Yeah, my thoughts are that again. I'm not going to yeah. say that that's always mm -hmm. bad. What I am going to say, or no, I'm certainly not going to say that it's always the right. right thing. What I'm going to say is that we, you know, that that every this should be a very individual decision within the family with the proper professionals outside of outside influencers, whether they're other teenagers, whether it's social media, whatever. Um, it should be something that's very, very carefully uh, evaluated, very carefully assessed, um, and very carefully done, if anything is done. In general, my belief is you're always better off yeah. waiting. And, and I just want to highlight what you said, because I agree. Really, you need a professional evaluation, yeah. and yeah. you have to rule out other things and really test like if people are on the spectrum and they haven't been diagnosed right. they have a different model of reality than neurotypicals and a huge number of folks who are neurodiverse are you know naturally you know gender fluid because they don't think the same way that absolutely mm. true absolutely true and that and and what you just said uh I was about to say that, you know, when you're talking about an evaluation, it can't be 15 minutes with a doctor or a nurse practitioner. We're talking about a real evaluation here. We're talking about sitting down for a few hours with a mental health professional, with a, a, uh, with a, a medical professional who knows the field, who, who can establish rapport, who speaks not only to the, the child involved, but to the parents, maybe to siblings. You're saying uh, really important things. I'm really glad that you you do. I, 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 will, I will also add that I uh, talked with a psychologist, sexologist who specializes with folks on the spectrum. And in her clinic, mm -hmm. they do a team evaluation of 10 different yeah. professionals. And it's not on one day for several hours. It's over weeks. Like they don't rush to do hormone therapy or, or especially surgical things until they're really darn sure that there's more harm done by, by, by not proceeding in right. their experience. That, that would, in my mind, that would be a, like a gold standard. Because mm -hmm. again, we're talking about, you know, when you're talking about hormones when, and certainly when you're talking about surgery, you're talking about processes that can have permanent, uh, that, that can cause permanent changes. Hormones can make you sterile. Yes, and they can ruin a right. lot of your internal organs. Right, they can mess with your internal organs. Exactly. So I, you know, when you talk about, as you've mentioned much earlier, about informed consent, there is there are a few areas in life that that demand more informed consent than dealing with your physical gender. Right. And you know, I'm just going to 
come back to the cult field for a moment and just mm -hmm. say, you know, when I'm hired to talk to someone who's involved with a controversial group, my frame isn't to talk them out of it. It's to do psychoeducation, explain models of social psychology, yeah. encourage the person to go back and think about how, what they thought they were joining and to, and to try to encourage them to make their own decision. And for me, if somebody's thinking about, you know, taking medication or having surgery, I really think they should talk to critics and talk to detransitioners who regret yeah. yes. having done these things and at least expose themselves that there really is a downside. And one, one objection I have is when people say, you know, like they do with an ex-scientologist, oh, you can't talk to them, you know, or an ex Mooney. You know, like they're they're toxic. Don't talk to those those people. And it's like if you're an intelligent, educated person and you think want to make a good decision, hear different sides so you can make yeah. an informed choice. We live in a we live in a culture and a society that's extremely fast paced, and there's a lot of pressure to make decisions mm. quickly. And there are times when, yeah, that's what you should do. I mean, there are times when you have to make a quick decision and that's the right thing to do. This, When you're dealing with gender and sexuality, that's not one of those right. times. Um, I, absolutely. I, I feel very strongly. And when you're dealing with your spiritual life, when you're dealing with your reason for being on this planet, right. uh, you know, th you don't rush into these things, right? right? Th I mean, think of it, put it this way. Uh, you know, imagine that you live in a society or a civilization where there's marriage, but no divorce. There's no chance mm. of divorce. So are you going to marry the first person, you know, the, someone that you've met for 15 or 20 minutes? Or are you going to really be careful? Yeah, someone who was assigned because, to you by your parents or, course, yeah, or a right. leader or right. where you're in a group that says you can't have premarital sex, even if you kiss, you should marry the right. person. Like, is that, does that right. make any sense? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, Dr. Steve Eichel, uh, fount of knowledge, uh, I'd like to give you the last words. Any any words of wisdom to leave our listeners with on this? We've covered a bunch of uh, overlapping topics, but yeah, always maintain your curiosity. Always be curious. Um, I'm very active in a very small organization called the American Academy of Psychotherapists. And, uh, and AAP, in fact, it's, it's a pretty intense organization to the point where I actually did a, uh, a workshop for AAP called, Is AAP a Cult? <laughs> um, cool. <laughs> so, uh, and it has some cultic aspects to it. you got to be careful. I mean, I, I, the, the people who were in that workshop were very good about ident identifying certain aspects yep. of uh, being involved in a professional organization that can be sure. a little culty. Sure. Um, but at any rate, <clears throat> the uh, there's a sort of an unofficial slogan for the American Academy of Psychotherapists is less judgment, m more curiosity. I like yeah. that. Only as far as cults go, let's forget about the judgment part. I think judgment's a good thing. Um, definitely be curious. If someone tells you something, and pro especially... The other, the other thing um, that I think is really important is there's an there's among scientists there's a uh, uh, sort of an unwritten rule that the more incredible the claim, the more incredible the evidence is demanded. Right, right is demanded. So you know you've got a group that's claiming it's going to solve the world, save everyone. You know you better demand some pretty solid evidence for yep. that, and you have the right to demand that yeah, evidence. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for your incredible you. work. You're in Delaware? In, I'm yep. in Delaware. And right? we're going to do a blog and we'll put your website up and um, continued success and we'll be in touch soon. So, Thank you. And I will see you in Kentucky, I, yes, I believe. Yes, right? your organization, you're on the board of directors, I believe. Uh, yes. The International Cultic Studies uh, Association has a conference annually, and it's in, in Kentucky the end of June, beginning of July. And I believe I'm mm -hmm. speaking uh, there I as well. You are. So I'll see you there. Great. Thanks so much. Good care. Bye. 
Steve Hassan here. You know, it's been decades since my family rescued me from the Moonies. I've been at this for over 47 years. The need has never been greater. If you're able, please consider hitting the super thanks button below and it'll help us to do better. Every penny will help us toward our goal of educating the planet about undue influence. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it.